say thank you, Imam Yusra. My job is really done. He did most of it, didn't he? Um, so, first of all, it leaves me just to tell you about the surreal experience it is for me just being here in Sweden today. Um, Sweden is, is a very sentimental destination because it's the first time that, I'm, that I am actually here. Um, I come from apartheid South Africa and um, I had an older sister who was a political activist together with myself and as a teenager we had this fight already to, to go beyond the label and the limitations. Not knowing today, I realize, is that really necessary? But we fought nonetheless because apartheid is an unjust and a system that had to, we had to change. So the activists were born in us from a very young age. And so going back to why Sweden is really special for me is my late sister, she got exiled um, at a very early age and she was granted political asylum in Sweden. You took her in, you were very kind to her and I lost her 13 years later. Tomorrow, after the retreat, inshallah, I plan to visit her grave 30 years later. And that in itself is, I sit here in gratitude and I can say thank you. Um, my story is, I know a lot of the ladies came up to me and spoke to me about the entrepreneurship, woman empowerment, etc. But I thought I'd like to start with my story. We all have a story. And sometimes these stories need to be told and shared. Because that's what we as, as women, we do that naturally anyway, isn't it? So inshallah men, I do hope you'll learn something today. Um... I, being an activist, I was a rebel with a cause and then after apartheid without a cause. And being a rebel meant you, you defied all the rules. So I had to learn life very, very hard way. It started off with me being, coming from a very staunch Muslim family. My dad's, um, a tab he belongs to a tabligh jama'ah. And Salah was enforced upon us at a very early age. Um, I didn't take very kindly to it because I really would prefer that you inform and educate me as to why I'm doing what I'm doing instead of you are supposed to be doing this, no questions asked. So I ran away from myself, far, far away. I became a teenage pregnancy statistic. I ended up running as far away as Kenya. I thought that getting married to a rich, older man is really the solution to everything. Four daughters later, and I was still searching, and I was miserable, and I was ill, and I was a mother. I had no idea as to what I was supposed to do and where I was going. And religion and spirituality was not an option. Besides, I had enough distractions. I could get onto any flight, go to any part of the world. I could ask my full-time driver to take me to any destination. Uh, I had the life. But at 30 years old, I had four kids and I was empty, depleted. I became ill, very, very ill, to a point where I could not walk. And my parents had to come to Kenya, bring me back to South Africa. And once I was strong, you know, the old saying, you made your bed, you have to go back and you have to make it work, you have to lie in it. So there I was in this marriage, and very unhappy kept filling myself up with more and more material things. But I was not going to pray because I was angry. I was angry with Allah. And eventually I knew that I could not go on like this any longer. I took my four daughters, got into a flight, five suitcases, 
and I went back to South Africa. Started life on a floor with my dowry. Ladies, demand the highest dowry. It does serve you. <laughs> okay. All my bank accounts frozen, and now I only have myself, my dowry to depend on. No family, because all they wanted to do was send me back to Kenya. And I had to make it work. And we can do that as women, can't we? We're survivalists. We know how to survive. And that's exactly what I did. Got the first thing was to get myself a job, build my career, get my kids into a school, best education, and I just worked and worked and worked. And sooner or later, I went out. I had a major, major breakdown. And I remember driving my daughter to school one day after a weekend, because weekends were extremely lonely. I had no friends. I, had, uh, I was in Johannesburg, away from my family, and no network. The Muslim families thought there was something wrong with me because is there, is there such a thing as divorced women in Islam? Are they kind to us? Well, not in South Africa at least. So I was alone and I broke down. I pulled off from the side of the road and I just cried and cried and cried. And the questions I had was, yeah, Allah. Suddenly I remembered Allah at this moment. And I said, Allah, is this what you have created me for? Is this what living is about? And I cried for 30 minutes nonstop, but deep sobbing. The questions were thrown out, and it was at that point that I knew I needed to change or do something differently. And eventually I ended up going to a yoga studio and I actively participated in the practice of yoga. It saved my life in many ways. I did Bikram yoga, which is a 90 minute workout um, that really assists you to breathe through the heat, the heat the room so that it mimics India, the, heat, the, the, the temperatures in India. And uh, you sweat it out, you in a 90 minute meditation, and your body's doing all these amazing stuff. And you really, the healing takes place on a cellular level, physical level, and I guess emotional as well. I felt more wholesome about myself. And so I progressed to lots of other yoga practices. And there was this one yoga practice in particular where we were required to do the sujood and, and do some chanting that went with it. And that was the first time I heard, I, I, I really resisted the chant, but I, I quietly in the distance I heard, La ilaha illallah. I heard it, but I ignored it. This cannot be happening. I'm so, I'm, I'm, I, I did not say I'm not a Muslim. I was just angry with Allah. Later, I had a dream. I, I was reared by my great-grandmother. And in the dream, she comes to me and she reassures me that everything will be fine and I must be happy. And she requested for me to drink some saffron water. And, you know, for me it was, yeah, okay, I dreamt this, but do I really have to do this? Um, in discussion, I spoke to my mom, asked her a bit about my great-grandmother, and then her advice was, if, when you do get a dream with instruction, just do it. And that's what I did. Um, I drank the water, and when I looked in the cup, to return it to the kitchen sink, the saffron strands had formed the Arabic version of La ilaha illallah. And I was beside myself, I showed everybody that I knew, and that was my first affirmation. That I'm looking everywhere else, but I will not turn to where I come from. 
And that was the start of a new beginning for me, my birth of God consciousness. Um, when you throw out these questions, the answers do come. I think there's a very good Sufi saying that says, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And that's really what happened. And this, at this point, my teacher was Google. <laughs> because I'd figured out, you know, um, obviously I have not ever heard of Sufism. I didn't know anything about self-knowledge. All I knew is, make your salah five times a day, you fast in Ramadan, you wear your headscarf, etc., etc. That's all I knew. I went to my dresser. I bunked most of the classes anyway. So, you know, it, it, it really it didn't resonate with me naturally. I then decided to Google an ism because if Buddhism, because I really was inclined to go the Buddhist way. Uh, I loved the philosophy. After all, it's about love and peace and harmony and respecting Allah's creation. And it was sweet. It was accepting. The community loved me. They thought it was just amazing to have a Muslim woman in, in this circle. Um, I engaged in the meditation, which really helped me to get into my Salah practice in the beginning. Um, so, so after Googling the isms, I came across Sufism, read about it every single night. I remember putting the kids to sleep and, and going to the computer. It was my moment. I'm going to just take in everything quietly because I don't know that this was allowed. For me, it was a taboo. That's what I, I had this perception of it being taboo. And, and every single word that I read was like, ah, exactly what I needed to read. So now the next big question, I was staying in Johannesburg, a huge city where our walls are so large that we don't even know our neighbor. So where do I go? Where do I find people that adhere to this belief of Sufism, etc.? Again, like I said, when you ask the questions and you have a desire and a yearning, it will come back to you. Throw it out there. What came back to me was in the form of a birthday party by a friend, and I thought I'd do the courteous thing, take her the gift, go and wish her happy birthday and disappear. It wasn't to be. I'd met someone from my past who was sitting at that table and whilst everyone was partying and having a merry time, all I could speak to him about was Islam and the lack of knowledge and support that I have around me, etc. And he looked at me and he just had one sentence. He said, Rayana, it's not coincidental that we met today. And he said this and I just, I went cold. Because I believed him straight away. I believed him. Two days later, I follow him. He takes me to the Rasuli Center in Pretoria, where uh, Sheikh Fadlala resides. And he says, this is where you're going to find like-minded people. The questions you're asking, it will be answered. And that was me connecting with the community that I could pray together with, that I could take my daughters who I had extracted out of the madrasa by then. The minute they came to me and said, Mom, um, my appa says, or my madrasa teacher says that you're going to go to Jahannam. I was like, no, you're not going tomorrow. This is, we have to break the circle. There has to be another way. There has to be another method of learning who Allah is. And that's when I realized I really didn't know. And I was so fearful. And I was so ashamed. I felt I wasn't deserving of knowing who our Lord is. And that was what really kept me from bowing my head down and just saying, Ya Allah, 
you are my rock. Ya Allah, you are my rock. Life-saving words. Um, meeting with Chef Lala, the first question he posed to me was, when is enough enough? me three months to really try and understand that question. When is enough enough? When do we get off this roller coaster of life? <coughs> We've had talks about the soul, the nafs. And for me the learnings were so real that I actually would speak to, to my nafs. <laughs> my kids would always make a joke about it. That's your nafs? Okay, nafs, behave yourself right now. <laughs> but that's how I got through it. That's how I could understand where I was at and relate to my next action and my next action. I'm a doer, you see. I can read the books, but I need to, like the Sheikh before, uh, Sheikh Aziz had said, the experience. It's the experience that matters the most. So my challenge was, to find the stillness again, to find me again, to, to find the love for myself again. Because as women, we really are harsh, very, very hard to ourselves, aren't we? We beat ourselves up all the time. I'm too fat, I'm too lazy, I'm not doing my best, etc., etc. The list goes on. But if we actually just look at, look at ourselves in the mirror and we see the perfection with which Allah has created us. Wow, we can only be in awe. Um, I read, or I think I had a discussion with my husband not too long ago, where he said to me, do you know that a woman has two hearts? That's how different she is from a man. And I thought about this for a while. How can a woman have two hearts? But of course she can. When she's expecting, she has two hearts. Now how special and unique must that be? Do we know that enough? Do we celebrate ourselves as women? Do we give ourselves that space? And that's the one thing that I had to change. The first was creating my own sacred space in my home. And these are tools that I'd like to share with you today. When I went into my home, I created a sacred space where I could pray, I could sit in meditation, I could put out my favorite books, I could burn my incense sticks, I could... It was my space. I could speak to Allah. How many of us have these huge spaces, but it's a ritual. This was a little small space in my bedroom that became such a big part of my journey. Throw down the yoga mat. And so now the yoga mat wasn't being used to exercise. Yeah, still that, but most importantly, I prayed on my yoga mat. Sacred space. The other big tool was journaling. I would write about how I felt. I would write about whenever I felt really angry or I felt that I needed to forgive someone. Because forgiveness is huge. We forgive, we, we, we can forgive each other, but do we actually forgive ourselves? Because like I said earlier, we are so hard on ourselves. Forgive yourself. Let it go. I learned a very good process for angry letters because you know we can blame the men in our lives we can blame our mom and our dad etc but where does that anger go we need to get it out and so what I found was also a very useful tool was writing the letter first day and you write whatever you want I'm so angry with you because you did this to me blah 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 write it out fold it put it away the next day, and I used to do this at Fajr every single morning. It's a three-day process. The next day, take the letter out, read it, add, edit, whatever you need to do, back it away. The third day, take out the letter again, 
read it, edit it, take that candle and you burn it. It works. Okay? These are your angry letters. Okay, so men, if you do see letters stacked away where your wife's trying to hide, please just give him that space, okay? So, the two books that also really helped me was Beginning Ends and Journey of the Self. I don't know if you have it on sale here at all. It's by Sheikh Lala Hayri. But Journey of the Self was fascinating because it really gave us a, an outline of the, the psychology of who we are. Okay, I won't go into too much because I think I'll leave that to the scholars. But... It really gave me a very good indication as to um, our makeup. Um, the 99 names, it's what I carry with me all the time. It's what I go to as a book. I don't know if any, if, if you have, do you have any other 99 names here? Uh, not here. Okay, but this is very powerful, ladies. 99 names, the first one that resonated for me was Yawadud, love, or loving. And so whenever I felt I was angry or I wasn't in a good space, I'd be Yawadud, Yawadud, I'd cook and throw Yawadud into the food, and Yawadud, Yawadud, it works. Um, Yafata, um, you know, Bismillah, it's an opening. It, for me, it, it really indicated a key that you need to just unlock, unlock that door and step right through it. Yeah, fatah. So I found, I used to, with the, with the 99 names, I would open it up and that would be my liquid for the day. Um, oh, going back to me not wanting to pray, I found that when I took wudu, I decided, let me try this, okay? And I started with the wudu first. And I did it very deliberately. I allowed that water to pour very slowly. And, it, and it, it, you actually feel that water over your limbs, that it's cleansing. And, and, and try this, try this at home, okay? Do your wudu with such deliberateness. And every time that water is poured over your limbs, just feel the flow of it, cleansing. And so once I, I, I completed my wudu, I would go and sit on the musala. I don't want to pray it, so I just go and sit. And just think, think about Allah, think about how I'm going to pray, why I should pray. And I think I did this for about a week. I would just go and sit. I'd put on my headscarf, my cloak, and I'd sit on that musala. And eventually, I got into the practice of prayer. And my first prayer was so sweet. I just wanted to stay in sujood. In fact, I saw a time is when I really feel I need to stay there. I do. Stay in your sujood. Rest there. The ground also absorbs all the negativity. This is your third eye that is touching the ground. And that is the place of absolute submission. So that was my journey of consciousness. And a renewed relationship between myself and my Lord. Consciousness. So I'm going to break this down into three talks. I will do one more, which would be about connect. The three C's being consciousness, connect, and continuity. The continuity I will leave for tomorrow's talk, where I will tie it in with the sacred economy and combining everything that I've, this journey that I've encountered over the last 10 years had to manifest into something physical. Like I said, I'm a doer. And so I will talk about what that physical is and how it affects women and the empowerment of women and what I term the sacred economy. So we go back to um, the other C, 
which is now connect. And this is the Sharia, the path to the well. And I guess it starts with knowledge. I, by this time, became so thirsty for knowledge. I'd take all the books and just read it through the night and read it over and over again until I'd become really ill and just want to pass out. And what I didn't tell you is, when I went to the center to meet with Sheikh Fadlala, I then also was introduced to Imam Nusra, who subsequently we had met after 23 years. We were at primary school together. So when his name was mentioned, it was like, oh my, I know who he is. <laughs> and at the time he was busy doing development, he was busy developing module two of uh, Sheikh Falala's work at the Academy of Self-Knowledge. And so with me reading all the time, I'd often email him and please can you help me with this section, I really don't understand or I'd read all night and by morning I'm like, I'd be in such a state and he was always there, <laughs> email away, trying to break it down because this path is, is, is just so much sweeter when you, when you have a partner, when you have a friend that you can discuss, that you can practice together with. And, well, I chose Imam Nusra. And Shukr, today we married. Um, yeah, I decided, you know what, I, I just can't be emailing him. Let me just bring him home and marry him. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, here he is. <laughs> um, for me, it was engaging in the practices and through the reading, the vicars, I would be in a vicar every single Thursday, Friday, and you get to a point where you're in absolute ecstasy. And with a partner, it's easier. You can also just bring it back down, ground again, you know. Um, after all, we are in this world. And, and me being an empath, those who don't know what an empath is, um, I feel what other people feel. Um, I always used to think it was normal, but I realized oh, there's a scientific <laughs> thing to this. Um, so an empath, I feel what other people feel to a degree where if you are ill and I'm in you and, and I'm near close to you, I'd be able to feel your illness as well. So obviously going into a vicar or meditation, I I, I, we, we kind of make a joke about it. I take off very quickly. And so I think um, being in a community and having a huge circle of friends that really understood where I was coming from and supported and encouraged me really, really helped. So if you're on this path, um, I, I think it's just unbelievable that we have, that you have this amazing community here anyway. Reach out to each other. I find that a lot of times we, we all come together, but how often do you actually walk away and know who stood next to you in prayer or who sat next to you in vicar? We become a paranoid society where we, we just don't touch each other. I love hugging and kissing. Hug your neighbor. Kiss your neighbor. It's okay. You have to be able to share what you're feeling, especially I noticed in the vicar yesterday, and I know that a lot of you are neutered, but part of the adab of the vicar, and you'll see the men do it, okay, is they greet each other afterwards. So turn to your left, turn to your right, and greet each other. In the mosque, find out about each other. So, obviously with my reconnectedness, um, I needed to also wean myself away from the corporate world and the madness because that's the challenge. You find yourself on a path and you still have to go to work and meet the people that you did in your past life and a lot of times you're lost in all of this. You don't understand how, how does this balance work, you know. You're in a job that you know is most probably not lined up to your values or aligned to your values. But you have to do it anyway, because you need the paycheck. And um, 
At the time, I worked for a telecommunications company. I would come home after Maghrib every single day because our tech department was in America and I needed to sit with them. That meant that my kids were alone and they weren't doing Maghrib together and they were really left in the care of a stranger. I took the plunge to do or die and I said, no, I can't do this any longer. My kids need a mother and so I'm going to say goodbye to corporate. And now I don't have the comfort and the luxury of a salary. Imam Nusra and I were just recently married. Um, he came with his suitcase into my house. It's okay, ladies, we can propose and we can... I mean, we just got to take the example of uh, Hadija. <laughs> I think she was extremely empowered. Um, and, yeah, we built together. I traveled to places like India, Vietnam, Pakistan, and it really was an extension of my vicar, because I believe that there's so much beauty that's been created out there with our hands. And here we are subscribing to um, brand, brand names, labels, etc. We, we know we're going to have the consciousness to tap into our own heritage and to be able to enjoy the products that come from that. And that's really what I, when my journey started with the sacred economy. It was traveling to far away exotic places, Morocco, Morocco's great, they've got amazing craft. And going to understand and tap into the craft and bring it back home and have events around it and educate people about the beauty. With this, I now was taking ownership of who I was. I was no longer the trophy wife. I was no longer the superwoman, because that's how people perceive me as. Single mom with four kids. I single-handedly put them through their education. And at the expense of me being really ill. But now, I was married to my best friend. We were on a path together. We were busy building a business and eventually came together under my first company, which I formed, which, was called, which is called Harem. Harem meaning a sacred space for women. And the intention behind it is really for women to come together from all parts of the world and share their creativity and so that we can all be part of it, whether we're creating it, producing it, or we are the consumers. Um, so with all these changes, I, I didn't tell you that in the beginning with apartheid, one of the sacrifices that I had to make was my education. Uh, we basically boycotted everything, all white products, our education that we thought was really beneath us because we were segregated. So we had um, education for whites, education for uh, blacks, and what we were termed as coloreds or Indians. And it was inferior education. So we just decided we're not writing our exams and we paid the price. So my aim was always to get back into school to finish my my matric, which is the final year of high school. And when in Kenya, I, I did quite a few diplomas and eventually I could get back into my studies. But for me, my dream was always to have a degree. But with motherhood and the business of life, it seemed nearly impossible. Instead, when um, my kids still also tease me about this, when my first daughter enrolled for her law uh, degree and uh, I was at the university queuing with her and, and I said, look, she thinks she's busy enrolling today. <laughs> but Shikar, with this path, there's so many gifts. I um, won a scholarship uh, at the University of Pretoria. I studied uh, entrepreneurship, the sciences of entrepreneurship. There were 300 women that were chosen in South Africa and I presented them very proudly. 
and it was a huge, huge achievement for me when I graduated. Um, I also am a Sherry Blair mentor, um, which means that we mentor uh, entrepreneurs around the world um, on email or Skype, etc. Um, but I'll tell you a bit more about that tomorrow. The sacred, that's part of the sacred economy. Back to me taking ownership of who I was and what I'd become. Because we're also being indoctrinated in many ways that you don't celebrate your successes. As women, we need to be quiet and kind of work really hard, but you never take the credit for it. So I started stepping out because what I was experiencing, I wanted for other women to experience as well. So I'd find my home filled with women coming from everywhere <laughs> wanting to get guidance and understanding of if they were coming from a divorce. Because that's big. I don't know if it's huge here, but in South Africa it's very huge. And so of course the challenges are kids from different parents. For instance, Nusra's got four kids from his previous marriage. I have four from my previous marriage. That's eight. And then we have one together, little Fatima Zara, who's now six years old. That's nine kids. So that's challenging dynamics. <laughs> but Shukur, um, little Fatima is the bridge between the two families. And yeah, I think we learn every day because our kids, they come to teach us. You know that, ladies. We need to listen to them sometimes because they come with very, very strong messages. Um, we just come off an Umrah, which is gifted to us. And this just falls under the many gifts that one receives when you're on this path. And you really throw yourself into you work selflessly. Because, you know, we, all, we, we believe that you have to be able to, to take. But if we give, the receiving comes so much more. And we were supposed to come in February and somehow it didn't happen with our visa delays, etc. And um, only for us to then receive this gift of an Umrah. And when we went on this Umrah, uh, it was really such an intense journey. And we knew that clearly the Umrah had to take place first before we came to Sweden. Not that this isn't another journey. <laughs> this really is. Um, after the amazing speakers we had here today, I think there's lots to reflect upon. Um, with the Umrah, um, I just wanted to say that it was my second one in the 10 years. The first one was accompanying a friend and you know the internet dating. It was the most awful situation I'd ever encountered. She had asked me to accompany her and her son who was ill, he had a brain tumour. And going on this Umrah, I thought, okay, you know, it's the right thing to do, she needed me. We arrive at the hotel room only to find someone waiting for her. And I'm sharing this with you because this is what's happening out there in sacred places like Mecca and Medina. And so now what do I do? We've share, we're sharing a room. Here's this gentleman claiming to be her husband-to-be. And here I am, not going to share my space with anyone else. Shukur, I'm ever grateful for her because it just led me to go and live in the haram full-time. I slept. And I walked the streets of Mecca and Medina. And I'd only go home when I knew he wasn't around. They did eventually get married. 
So we're challenged by all places and spaces. Where are we safe? We are safe in our homes with our family, and we are safe when we are tuned to La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. I can't stop it. It's perfect timing. <laughs> Amazing. So that goes to show it takes a